Okay, so one of the things I'd like to start with is, is uh, we talk about climate and there's a lot of discussion today, but um, people change the climate. Um, and then to us, any solution to that has to be a people solution. Now I'm standing here as a technology company, a software company, deep tech, AI, all the buzzwords you want to talk about. But ultimately, we're a people company. So people can be the solution, but they're only going to be the solution if it's easy, fast and reliable, surefire. If they don't trust things that are happening, if it makes their day harder, if it takes a long time, it does all these sorts of things that gets in the way. So our uh, objective at CIM is a number of things. There's no product in the world that looks after the 2.5 million people who run facilities globally. They get a mismatch of different things that they have to use, a lot of manual processes, a lot of other things like that, but there's nothing for them. Um, now, if we can empower that, that group just within our existing clients, we can save a gigaton of CO2, which would put us in the top handful in the world of companies reducing CO2 emissions, something we're very proud of. Now, today, we're only at about 250,000 metric tonnes a year, but that still puts us in the top one or two in Australia for emissions today, but a long, long way to go. Now, every one of our clients, which are the biggest real estate investment trust, they're the biggest shopping centre companies, all of those, have fantastic future trajectory around their net zero and are really committed to doing something about that. But it's unfair on them to make them, to make them implement something that's going to cost them a lot of money and not return them value. All of our clients buy our software because it makes their assets more valuable. They save money in their operations. In fact, in only a few months, a multi-year contract, some people don't do multi-years with us, but a multi-year contract is paid back for them and they're in the black, but that's just when they start saving money. It's not where they end saving money. But more significant than that, and I have to congratulate, What Watches is a fantastic company. So if you've got investors there, we think it's great. Um, but the data part that, 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 that they were talking about and Gavin was talking about is far more valuable now than it's ever been in the past. And we're actually learning every day what our clients are doing with that data. They're participating in future hedging contracts for carbon markets. They're deciding on new buildings. They're buying new tech pieces of equipment. They're employing new contractors, all based on the data that they get out of our system for them. That happens every day. So how does it work? Well, I'm not an engineer, so if you ask me really technical questions, I won't be able to answer them, but I'll give you the highest level. At the highest level, we're trying to solve a couple of problems. So first, the data. Collecting the data is an extremely difficult thing to do. Most of our clients have anywhere between 8,000 and 12,000 connected devices that are different. They have different protocols, they speak different languages, they whatever else it is. We connect to every single one of those devices. So we connect to BMS, we connect to meters, we connect to smart meters, but we go right down to the equipment level. It's pretty amazing when you think of how do we read all of these devices that speak differently. And to be frank, some of those devices do not want us to be able to read their pieces of equipment. And so there's a challenge that we've been able to get through, but we've been able to get through that challenge. Today, we ingest about 3.5 gigabytes of data every day into our system, and it's polled across our entire global network every 15 minutes. So every 15 minutes, we'd effectively do a snapshot of everything that's happening in that building for every one of those devices and work out what could, could be done with that. So that all goes into this black box, which is not actually a black box, so that's effectively our software. That has, it's a ba basically an AI expert system. It has about just under 300,000 algorithms in that, which are digitising engineering practices. So in this scenario, with this sort of circumstance, here's the practice that you should put into place. That took us about six years to write that piece of software. Not to make it work 80% of the time, but at 80% of the time, if 20% of the time I get a, an action which is pushed out of our software, and I'll show you that in a second, if I get an action and I don't trust it, then I go back to the old manual way. I talk to my engineers, I get vendors to come in, I have meetings, and I actually don't use it, I don't make it easy for people. So it has to be extraordinarily reliable once we'd done that, we thought, okay, we've got this system that digitises engineering. Wow, that's pretty impressive. We've solved the data problem. Wow, that's pretty impressive. And as a team, we said, okay, let's work out which island we're going to buy because we've nailed it. 
what we realised is that there are people in the mix. You can't automate a building. Uh, if you can tell me how you automate removing a rat out of a duct that's sticking somewhere, well then I'd love to hear it and we'll take it on and we'll see if we can do that. We do some amazing dynamic things that are first to market around dynamic control to outside set, set temperatures and things like this. But we never take the people out of the picture, we empower them. So today, what happens to the people on our platform is when they wake up in the morning, they get an email that says, this is the things that we suggest you do today. And on that, they can hit a button. As soon as they hit the button, those things get done automatically. Some will not be done automatically. Some will go to a vendor. Some will go to other places. Uh, but the whole collaborative suite is there. So there might be just them, but they might have another 200 people on the licence for that building or all the different people that they can manage that. And we track absolutely everything through that process. At the highest level, when we talk about the climate model, there's a monitoring process that we fo follow, an optimization process that we follow. That monitoring is monitoring all of those behaviours. Today, what we monitor is completely different to a year ago. Now we're monitoring CO2, we're monitoring heat stress in the corner of buildings, we're monitoring the distribution of airflow across buildings because they're trying to, our clients are trying to bring people back to work and make the place uh, fantastic. All those types of things. So we monitor all those, we optimise them very quickly and then we create a situation where the building automatically optimises itself after that. So it knows the algorithm, it fixes things. But that leads to questions about upgrades and electrovation. It re leads to how you bring renewables off-site and blend them into your environment. Some of our clients are looking at massive battery systems. They already have charging infrastructure. They all already have a whole stack of thing in there and that makes it even more complicated. And then, of course, some of our clients, majority, we have a couple of clients who, who are going for, for absolute zero targets. Most of them are on net zero targets and they'll have carbon offsets and they, with our data, participate in the financial markets for hedge against those so they can know exactly what their forecast trajectory based not on our, just on ours but on upgrades of equipment, different, a whole grasp of things that they could do to get to their net zero process. So ultimately, without us, this is what happens. Something's not, you're not quite sure what's going on. A group of people meet. They meet generally at least every month in the FM team, sometimes more. There's engineering, there's people from different vendors, there's BMS, there's ESG. And this fellow over in the corner is the FM responsible for a client who could be their own boss saying it's not working, you're spending too much energy, or things are breaking, whatever else, or a tenant saying it's a terrible experience, what are you going, and can't work out who's responsible and what to do. These meetings disappear when our software exists. A way of explaining it is you can imagine the, 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 the servicing in your car and you go and get your car serviced and then the car companies brought in a little bit of smart intelligence into those and they tried to bring a lot of that into their own then they gave it away for free. You're still having to go in. You still have to go 10,000. You still have to go when actually you probably don't need to go. There's nothing wrong with your car. It's just scheduled to happen. And then you go when something's broken, not when you could have fixed it cheaply. Then Tesla comes along and says, we don't even know what services are. There's no such thing. We will tell you only what you need to do when you need to know it. And if that is just replace tyre three in the front corner, you go to a place and you get it fixed. Or if that's something I can do overnight by software, just do it. About 50% of our changes are not manual touch and about 50% require a person to go out and do things. Um, this sort of stuff uh, is to us a, a, a history. So where are we in the market? We're about 7 out of 10 of the largest shopping centres in Australia, or 33 out of 50. The maths is quite right, so 35 now. We have the largest shopping centre operator. We're 6 out of 10 of the REITs in Australia. We're the largest commercial operator. Uh, we have all the major leaders of neighbours except one, which we're really annoyed that we don't have them. Um, uh, we have high-tech manufacturing around the world with companies like Johnson & Johnson and others who their needs are more complex around uh, keeping the manufacturing site uh, at a certain level. And we've just established now in the UK and the US. We, have biz we already have buildings in both of those places. So we do about 10.7 million square kilometres, 15 countries, about 1,100 active users. Uh, we, we raised uh, roughly $20 million last year, so we're actually looking for money right now. Um, we're trying to not spend it too fast, which is more what I'm interested in at the moment. Um, so what do we need to scale? Um, 
when you're introducing a new technology, it's all about change, and particularly around changing people. If people don't know that you can do things and they don't have confidence, they don't have expectations. If they don't have expectations, you don't have senior people saying, hey, we should be able to fix that. We shouldn't be spending money on these. We should be able to do these things differently. And what's happened in our market, and there was a speaker talking before about digital twins, as an example of an area where they heavily overused terminology that created a whole stack of promise but didn't deliver on it. And so a lot of the senior people in our industries do not trust anyone coming along saying they can do the sorts of things that we want, despite 300 buildings where we deliver in every single one of them. Now we don't have that problem because we say, look, go and ask Charter Hall or Center Group or GPT or any of these people and you'll see that we deliver exactly what we said. But within our um, ecosystem, which includes some of the people here, there's still a massive amount of both misinformation and lack of information about what's possible now. Um, and a lot of jingles and words come out when people say, have you got AI? And we go, well, yes, we do, but what do you mean by that? What are, what are you trying to achieve by? Um, and then they'll get excited about something that doesn't deliver any value. Frankly, our biggest client is the internal, uh, internal IT team, who've been told to do a Google, you know, move it to cloud, create a digital twin, create your own app store, become a data company. Um, we know of at least a dozen in our client set who've done that and failed over the last two or three years. Um, and that's not a criticism of them so much, it's just very hard to do. Um, we also want channel partners. So we're a software company. We still need to fix things. We still have people who have different problems. We have markets that we don't access. We don't access small buildings. We don't access logistics centres. We don't access things like that. Some of them we're actually not good for. Some of them there are better technologies of some we talk today than what we do. They're just not, not actually right. But there are other areas where, where we actually could do things. And, and service providers who are offering a lot of help to their clients to build their ESG journey, we're only part of that journey. And so if we know we can be part of that journey and they can take that on, well then it gives them if I can be ruthless, it gives them a platform already that will generate enough return for them to stimulate the, a, a wider set of activities. The other thing is our value proposition. Um, and I know this sounds t terrible to put it, put it out to a group, but we're actually, we have real trouble explaining our category. Um, because are we a building analytics company? Yes. Are we an energy efficiency software company? Yes. Are we a workflow tool? Yes. Are we a contractor management system? Not in the technical way, but Yes. Are we a data management company? Yes. We're all of those things, but we're kind of not at the same time. We're actually something very, very different, um, and, uh, and we need help doing that. So we talked about our clients. They're well known. Um, they've been the biggest drivers of our technological advancement. The clients have pushed us. We've provided a platform, and they keep coming back to us and saying, I want more, I want something different. Um, Center Group, we have a new version of our product which is uh, a much simpler to use for a non-technical user, uh, a license only version. Center Group effectively trolled that for a year and a half uh, to do that with us and now have it over all of their buildings. QIC and others we, we just absolutely love, obviously Charter Hall is a bigger one. Um, the thing in effect that drives us in many ways is the happiness of the people using our platform. We measure ongoing engagement on an hourly basis for all of our clients and we measure how happy they are. Are their days better or not? And, and that's the thing that drives most of our design. And a lot of the team, when you look at our team structures, a lot of people design us from zero and things like this because we treat this really, really seriously. Um, that's it. Questions? Great. Thanks, Dave. So it's just we're running out of time, but we've got time for one or two quick questions. Yep. How long did it take you to fully set up and integrate it into their FM? Yeah, so um, a large-scale office tower is two days. We never visit a site. We've never visit, visited a site, so it's all done remotely. Um, uh, uh, and for a large shopping centre like Chadstone, it takes about an, an extra day, um, just because they can have multiple systems. Yeah. That took us about three years to work out how to do that, by the way. It used to take about Freezes seven months. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Appreciate it.